Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. So Maria Shell joins us. She lives in Alaska. She's a quilter, and she's got an awesome book on improv quilting called Improv Patchwork, Dynamic Quilts Made with Line and Shape. She's got a great philosophy about uh, quilting, and uh, she's awesome. Okay, so to begin, um, tell me your name and who you're calling from the preservation. My name is Maria Shell, and I am calling from Anchorage, Alaska. Well, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, was a professional seamstress. So she, by the time I came along, she was retired, but she made garments for people and she made quilts and basically everything um, on a treadle, actually. Really? Very cool. And then when did you start quilting? I know from your bio, uh, I know a little bit about you from your website, your bio and your book um, and your blog. But tell for those that don't know you um, uh, that it may be listening is um, when did you start sewing and quilting? I started sewing my hand when I was four. Uh, I think you know I'm genetically hardwired for needle and thread and then at the age of 10 my mom had promised me that she would get me a sewing machine when I turned 10 and I held her to it so I got my first sewing machine at 10 and I just sort of learned I did not learn sewing really from my grandma she was very um I mean we use the term quilt police I would say she she was a member um not very regimented and so I learned from I had a babysitter that taught me how to sew and then I took Comac um, and then I worked in the costume shop in college, and then I decided that writing was the highest creative profession, and I sort of, I never, I never thought that I would be a professional quilt maker or professional sewer um, until we, uh, after grad school, my husband and I moved to Valdez, Alaska, and they had a little quilt shop there, and I went in and signed up to take a class and um in many ways that was just like that was the end of it that was like I I had this feeling this is what I should be doing with my life but then it took like another 15 years before it actually became uh a profession where I make an income yeah how did can you help us understand that road of and what it means to be a professional versus a hobbyist Well, uh, that's a good question. For me, I define it as it is, it's my job. So I have a calendar of things I do and I have, and I make my income from quilt making. I do have many friends that quilt making is their second career. So they have, you know, maybe worked as an art teacher or work, you know, they had some other career and then they retired that they treat being a quilt artist as their current profession, but they don't necessarily have um, a financial, they don't necessarily need to make money from being a quilt maker. So I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting. Yeah. But it, it isn't like, so people out there, like I'm thinking about your grandmother and your, you do improv quilting and it's incredible and it's gorgeous and stunning and beautiful and your book is great. Um, it's really different than what your grandmother was doing, right? Yes. And it's kind of funny. I, my grandmother made uh, each of us, I'm the oldest of four girls, and she made us each this sort of one patch, kind of a, nor- a nine patch or a four patch, but it was just really a one square, like four inch squares of all the clothing that she had made us. They were the leftover scraps and she put them into a quilt for each of us. And in the corner, she embroidered Maria Christine, not my last name because she was sure that I would get married and that the last name would no longer, you know, my maiden name would no longer be relevant. And I thought 
that she was really just the utilitarian. She made utility quilts because of that. And then once I became a quilt maker, I was home in Kansas visiting my mother and she pulled, she's like, I need to show you these quilts your grandmother made. And she pulled them out and they were these beautiful, like, you know, I'm sure they would have taken prizes at the state fair. They were very traditional, beautifully crafted, um, contemporary for that time period. You know, I have a, I have her Dresden plate quilt made out of seed sack fabric. Um, the only thing that's kind of interesting is that she was, she was a hand piecer and a machine quilter, even though you know, this quilt was probably made in the 40s. Really interesting. Why do you think that was? I think she was so proficient on her machine. And I don't think, I don't think she was involved in any sort of community of quilters. I imagine she probably, you know, read a magazine or decided, I mean, she had the skill set to sew, so she just applied it to quilt making. And I don't think she would consider herself a quilt maker as much as she would consider herself a seamstress. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. So how did you get to improv quilting? Did you try all the other kinds of quilting before you got to improv quilting? Like what was your road to get there? Well, I took, so I, I took the, my first class, which was a mystery class. And those are, um, for your listeners who might not know, um, Debbie Caffrey is a uh, leader in the mystery quilt world. And it was a Debbie McCaffrey mystery quilt uh, that you get one set of instructions at a time. So the first thing you would get would be, you know, you pick your fabrics and you cut uh, strips. And then you go to the workshop and you get your next little bit of instruction. So you don't know what you're making. And that was my introduction to quilt making. And um, from there, I really was obsessed with precision quilt making. Like the next thing I wanted to make was the Lone Star, which mm. is a, a complicated quilt pattern. And I, at the time, I was... Um, working as an advocate at a women's shelter. And this is in Valdez, Alaska, and this is like sort of the centerpiece of the exhibit, summer exhibit at the museum was a textile exhibit, uh, really from the community members. And this large community that uh, Valdez, the Valdez Museum serves, I don't know, 300, it's a large area of Alaska that it is the museum. And it's just a little small museum, but the people that would contribute are from this vast area. Anyway, the centerpiece of that exhibit is that 10 nonprofits paired up with 10 local quilters and they, the local quilter made a quilt that was then part of the exhibit and people could buy raffle tickets. So people from all over the world bought raffle tickets and I made the raffle quilt for the woman's shelter for four or five years in a row. And the first one I wanted to make, which was like six months after I started quilting was this Lone Star and one of the other staff members, very, very particular quilt maker, basically told the staff that I wasn't capable at this stage <laughs> of my development as a quilt maker of yeah. making that quilt. So and it was really interesting. It's the first time I'd ever, it's like quilting by committee. Like she inspected my work and the rest of the staff was kept uh, up to date on my progress. <laughs> and uh, at the time, it's a funny story and I tell you know quilt makers the story and they're like kind of like I can't believe you subjected yourself to that and it's like well I didn't know any better and I wanted to make this quilt and in reality Sue's involvement was beneficial to me she guided me you know like one-on-one -on -one, uh a chance to study with someone who really was very proficient in the craft of quilt making so I learned my, I, I'm skilled as a traditional quilt maker and I valued that skill set. I, after that, I went on and I drafted my own feathered star quilt blocks. And, um, that foundation is why I can do what I can do now. Because if you look at my work, you see, there's a lot of little teeny itty bitty pieces that maybe I used a ruler or not. And that right. somehow I get them all to go together. And that is, because of my my original studies in quilt making. 
So if someone's out there and they too so want to become proficient, how do you become proficient? Like how do you go from just being an okay quilter to like a good quilter, you know? Right. Well, you study. Like I, I mean, I think about um, every night I'd go to bed and I would read old quilters newsletter magazines. And I, if, you know, I think we're going to talk about my book, but in the yeah. back of my book, in my resource section, the books listed there are the books I used that I studied. Let's see. And I think uh, Quilts, Quilts, Quilts has an excellent resource section in the very back about color and composition. I think right. Paula Nadelstern, her, one of her first books about kaleidoscopes really breaks it down in the way that she's using color and pattern. I mean, right. I use it in the exact opposite way from how she does it to create her kaleidoscope. But uh, I just read a lot. I took a lot of workshops. I mean, I was living in Valdez, Alaska, which is not, um, you know, people, when we first moved there, people said to us, well, at least it's on the road system. And then my, I'm like, what do they mean by that? And then, <laughs> well, they mean there's a road. <laughs> like there are places in Alaska where there are not roads to get in and out of and um, that you can only get in and out of via um, boat or plane. And yeah. uh, so it's a really remote, isolated community by most American standards. But we had that quilt shop and someone had, prior to me showing up on the scene, you know, 15 years prior to me, had introduced quilt making to that community and it, it kind of taken off. And so, um, and I was lucky in that way, you know, I was in this little rinky day town in Alaska, but it had this rich quilting tradition that I could tap into. And I was fortunate that my tears varied. I had Sue, who was taskmaster and very particular about everything and, and kind of hypercritical and then Trudy and Lil who were part of the quilt shop Lil was an artist by training you know she had gone to art school she was a painter and her approach was very different and then Trudy was sort of in the middle and more you know connected both to traditional and quilt. she was connected to traditional quilt making but she was there to support Lil and I doing whatever weird thing that we thought of that we wanted to do so I was very lucky it's really cool now um and the book the one thing that so the, the the list of books is really cool and it makes me want to just get all of the books um some of them I have some of them I don't but it does make me think about okay that's interesting I suspect that YouTube videos are the way people are learning more now but do you think there's still a role for books and in learning I do. And it's interesting because I, so I started out as a traditional quilt maker and then, and, and you know, stop me if I'm going off in the wrong direction. No, there's, but no, there's no direction. I, it's all good. Okay. So, um, 2009 and we moved to Anchorage and our youngest son, we had three boys and our youngest son was starting kindergarten and I had started exhibiting my work. Um, and I received some recognition for it. Anyway, I applied for, for um, what's called the Rasmussen Project Award. And the Rasmussen Foundation is an Alaska foundation. They used to own Bank of Alaska, and they sold it to Wells Fargo. In the 1950s, they funded it's what's called the Rasmussen Foundation. They funded a nonprofit that supports art, health, culture, basically anything that improves the quality of life for Alaskans. And one of the things they do, and it's part of their mission, is to support Alaskan artists directly. Very few organizations give artists and writers money just outright. Usually it's filtered through some other thing, or either it has to be a pro it's product driven, like we'll give you this money and then you give us this product. They just give artists and writers money. And they gave me $5,000 to go to Ohio and study with Nancy Crow for three weeks. That's so cool. And that, yes. So I'm studying with Nancy. Nancy has, um, she considers it, and this is, I think, fascinating. I think you probably would find this interesting too. When the fine arts programs of the 70s were formed and they, the MFA programs, and they started to introduce craft, 
glass blowing, ceramics, pottery, textiles. They did not 